The Effective Executive in Action Forward. This is a both a what to do and how to do it book. It's also a self-development tool by using the fill in the sections to record the decisions, the reasoning underlying them, and expected results of checking those actions against actual results. Executives and other professional contributors will learn fast of what they do well, what they need to improve on, and what they cannot even do poorly and should not be doing at all. They will learn where they are, where they belong. The format of this book was developed by my friend and a colleague Joseph M. Marciarelio, who is taught who has taught my work for 30 years and knows it much better than I do. Professor Marcel Riello decided on the topics. He then shows specific ex excerpts from my book and, work, and works by others, which constitute to the text of this work, and wrote the questions. My readers and I are greatly indebted to the Professor Marcel Riello. However, the book itself should have comments of actions and decisions and results recorded by the individual executive using the book as his or her tool to achieve effectiveness. Introduction. How to use the effective executive in action. The effective executive in action is a companion book to, an effective, to the effective executive. It provides a step-by-step -step guide to training yourself in an, as an effective person and the effective knowledge worker as an effective executive. For training yourself to get the right things done, this book will help you develop the habits of an effective and apply effectiveness to apply wisdom to your tasks. There are five practices or skills to acquire to be effective and effective person. And these five are managing your time. Focusing your efforts and making contributions. Making your strengths productive. Concentrating your efforts on those tasks that are most important to the results and making effective decisions. The first practice, managing your time, and the fourth practice, concentrating your efforts on the most important tasks, are two pillars upon which effectiveness rests. You can obtain greater quantities of your resources except time. Time is your most limited resource and time management is the foundation of getting the right things done. Improving your effectiveness begins by finding out where your time goes and then taking steps to eliminate those tasks that waste your time and the other times of others. Once you have eliminated the time wasters, the second pillar to set priorities for the use of your time is to concentrate on the application of your time to the highest priority of tasks. Here should be the priority of those tasks which make the greatest contribution to your organization. Establishing priorities and concentrating your efforts on them is a skill that requires foresight and courage. The remaining skills rest upon the two pillars of time, management, and concentration on priorities. To get the right things done, you must learn to focus your time on the efforts upon the tasks that will produce results for the organization. Here's your first concern concerning with what the real results for my position, and then how do I go about gaining commitment from others to help me attain these results? Next, you must learn to focus on your strengths, yours and your subordinates and your bosses. You must take steps to develop your talents and the talents of others. Your staffing and appraisal and your decisions must be made based upon what a person can do, based upon his or her strengths, not on weaknesses. The one exception to the rule is focusing on strengths and staffing decisions, character and integrity. The presence of integrity accomplishes nothing in itself, but is its absence in a leader of your organization faults everything else because the poor example it sets is for others. The last practice of effectiveness is decision making. Effective executives makes effective decisions. Decision making requires that you take specific steps such as making that you have defined the problem correctly and have established correct specifications for an effective decision but the effective decisions often result from a clash of opinions and decisions are not effective until they are turned into the work followed up by the feedback from their results. You will not develop into an effective person simply by reading this book. Skills are developed by doing and constant practice. This book provides you with opportunities to develop your skills. The opportunities consist of questions and actions at the end of each reading. Do you get the most from this book? To get the most from this book, you should fill in the opening spaces with answers to the questions and action steps that are posed after each reading. These questions are actions that are skill building exercises in this book. Question probe your present practices. They lead you to specific responses and contrast. Actions call you in the steps to improve performance and achievement. You should formulate specific actions that are appropriate to managing yourself and your organizations. We suggest that you learn one skill at a time. Each reading in this book and the reference of the section in its source book, The Effective Executive. The references at each of the teachings of specific and general passages in The Effective Executive. That pertain to the reading. The teaching, moreover, has been updated to reflect numerous writings of Peter Drucker since the publications of The Effective Executive, where Peter Drucker has written and spoken specifically about the five practices the five practices the material has been incorporated into by the primary reading of each chapter. In addition, the numerous sidebars of the book contain parallel readings from other works of Peter Drucker and refer more generally in each topic. In some of these readings, the sidebars also contain appropriate material from the author that is supplement point to be in the reading, the point to be made in the reading. We wish you success in your pursuit of effectiveness. And remember, with the exception and the exception of integrity, which has to do with being, the five skills of effectiveness have to do with doing. Consequently, the skills of effectiveness can only be acquired by practice and more practice. Effectiveness can be learned. 
effectiveness must be learned. The Effective Executive in Action Chapter 1 Effectiveness Can Be Learned Introduction Effectiveness is getting the right things done. It is the habit of constantly in the five-step practices. You can acquire the habit of effectiveness by practicing the way you acquire any other habit. The practice of the effective executives are five. Managing your time, focusing your efforts on making contributions, making your strengths productive, concentrating your efforts on those tasks that are most important to contributions, and making effective decisions. These practices are simple, simply deceptive so, but these practices are exceedingly hard to do well. You will have to acquire them as you learn the multiplication table that is repeated at Nasim until 6 times 6 equals 36 became an unthinking, conditioning, flex, and firmly ingrained habit. Similarly, you will learn the five practices of effectiveness by practicing and practicing and practicing them again. The Effective Executive, Chapter 1. Getting the right things done. To be effective, the knowledge work is, first of all, expected to get the right things done. Every knowledge worker is a modern organization is an executive. If the virtue of his or her position or, or knowledge, he or she is responsible for the contribution that materially affects the capacity of the organization to perform and to obtain results. The Effective Executive. Page 5 to 9. Questions. What am I getting paid to do? What should I be paid to do if I am being paid for getting the right things done in my position? And am I doing things that I shouldn't be doing? Jack Welsh realizes that he needed to be done in General Electric. He took over as chief executive who was not overseas expansion he wanted to launch. It was getting rid of the business that, no matter how profitable, could be the number one or number two in their industries. Peter F. Drucker, What Makes an Effective Executive, Harvard Business Review, June 2004. What needs to be done? Successful leaders don't start out asking, what do I want to do? They ask, what needs to be done? There are a risk of those things from which would make a difference. Which are the right, is this right for me? They don't tackle things that aren't good at. They don't tackle things that they aren't good at. They make sure other necessities get done, but not by them. They appoint someone else. Successful leaders make sure that they are effective. They are not afraid of strengths in others. Andrew Carnegie wanted to put out his on his gravestone. Here lies a man who knew how to put himself, to put his service men to put into his service men more able than he was of himself. Here lies a man who knew how to put into his service men more able than he was himself. Interviewed by Rich Carglard, Peter Drucker on Leadership, Forbes.com, November 19, 2004. Action. Eliminate or reduce the activities, activities that do not contribute effectiveness, the things that you shouldn't be doing. What are some of these activities? The authority of knowledge. For the authority of knowledge, it's surely de legitimate as an authority of position. The authority of knowledge. What few yet realize for how many people there are even in the most human organization today, whether business or government agencies, research labs, hospitals, who have to make decisions. For the authority of knowledge is certainly the legitimate as the authority of position. These decisions, moreover, are the same kind of decisions of top management. The effective executive, page 8 to 9. Questions. How do my decisions affect overall performance of the organization? What is limited in my ability to make contributions? Decisions are made at every level of organization, and apparently low-level decisions are extremely important in a knowledge-based organization. Knowledge workers are supposed to know about their areas of specialization, for example, tax accounting, than anybody else, so the decisions are likely to have an impact throughout the company. Peter F. Drucker, What Makes an Effective Executive? Actions. List the steps that you can take to remove the Imp impediments that limit your ability to make contributions. List the steps that you can take to remove the impediments that limit your ability to make contributions. Executive realities. The fundamental problem in the reality around the executive is there are four major realities over from which the executive has essentially no control. Every one of these realities exerts pressure towards non-results and non-performers. Number one, the executive's time tends to belong to everybody else. Number two, executives are forced by the flow of events to keep on operating. Number three, the executive, effective, the executive is effective only if and when other people make use of what he contributes. Number four, finally, the executive is within an organization he sees outside only through thick and distortion lenses, if at all, the effective executive. Questions. What major events prevents me from focusing on results? Am I a prisoner of inside events and politics? Actions. Begin to take steps to change your realities on focusing on contributions and results. Do not let the flow of events determine what you do. The effective personality. All effective executives have in common the ability to get the right things done. The effective executives I have seen differ widely in their temperaments and their abilities from what they do and how they do it, in their personalities and their knowledge and their interests. In fact, almost everything that distinguishes human beings, all they have in common is the ability to get the right things done. The effective executive. Questions. Who are the three effective knowledge workers, effective knowledge workers in any organization? organization. Who are the three effective knowledge workers in my organization? 
What are their prominent personality traits? How do these people use the traits of the form of the habits of effectiveness? What does this tell me about the relationship between personality traits and effectiveness? Effective executives differ widely in their personalities, strengths and weaknesses, values and beliefs. All they have in common is their things, their ability to get the right things done. Some are born effective, but they demand too great to be satisfied an extraordinary talent. Effectiveness is a discipline, and like every discipline, effectiveness can be learned and must be learned. The transition from an entrepreneur to a large company CEO. Again, let's start out discussing what not to do. Try not to be somebody else. By now, you have your own style. This is how you get things done. Now, don't think, don't to be to believe in yourself. Now, don't take on things you don't believe in and that you yourself are not good at. Learn to say no. Effective leaders match the objective needs for their company and their subjective com competencies. As a result, they get enormous amounts of things done fast. Interview with Rich Carglin and Peter Drucker on leadership. The danger of charisma. You know, I was first one to talk about leadership 50 years ago, but there's too much talk, too much emphasis on it today, and not enough on effectiveness. The only thing that I could say about a teacher is a leading is somebody who has followers. The only thing I could say about a leader is that a leader is somebody who has followers. The most charismatic leaders of the century were Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Mussolini. They were misleaders. Charismatic leadership in itself certainly is greatly overstated. Look, one of the most effective American presidents in the last 100 years was Harry Truman. He didn't have an ounce of charisma. Truman was a bland and dead mackerel. Everybody who worked for him worshipped him because he was absolutely trustworthy. And Truman said no. It was no. And if he said yes, it was yes. And he didn't say no to a person and yes to another person on the same issue. The other effective president of the last 100 years was Ronald Reagan. His great strength was the no charisma and the commonly thought he knew exactly what he could do and what he could not do. Interview with Richard Carligard. Level 5 leadership. One of the most damaging trends in the recent history of tendencies, especially by boards of directors, to select dazzling celebrity leaders as to deselect potential level 5 leaders. Jim Collins, good to great. Why some companies make the leap and others don't. Actions. Be yourself. Use the personality traits to form habits of effectiveness. Work on weaknesses that limit your effectiveness. Chapter 2. Know Thy Time. Introduction. Time is your limited resource and it's totally irreplaceable in your life. You cannot expand the amount of time you have available per day, week, or year. You can expand other resources such as capital and people your employ in your employ. Yet, everything you do requires your time. This means that your accomplishments and your effectiveness are set and limited by the way you manage your time. Your scarcest, scarcest resource. Unless you manage your time, you will not be able to manage anything else. The management of your time, therefore, is the foundation for your effectiveness. And the good news is is, is that you can manage your time and improve the management of the time from which you will practice and with this practice with constant effort and the effective executive time the limited factor to accomplishment effective people know that time is the limited factor the output limits any process from what is set by the scarcest resource and the process we call accomplishment this is time time is also a unique resource of the other major resources money is actually quite plentiful people the third limited resource one can hire but one cannot rent hire buy or otherwise obtain more time the supply of time is totally inelastic no matter how high in the demand the supply will not go up and moreover, time is totally perished, and it cannot be restored, and it cannot be stored. Yesterday's time is gone forever and will never come back. Time is, therefore, always an exceeding short supply. Question. Now, do I consciously behave as though time is a limited factor in my life? Knowledge is useful for executives until it's been a translated into deeds, but before springing into action, the executive needs to plan his course. He needs to think about desired results, probable restraints, futurable revisions, check-in points, and implications on how he could spend his time. The action plan is a statement, a statement of intentions rather than a commitment. It should be revised often, so because every success creates new opportunities, so does every failure. A written plan should anticipate the need for flexibility. In addition, the action plan needs to create a system for checking the results against expectations. Finally, the action plan has to be the basis for the executive's time management. Time is the executive's scarcest and most precious resource. The organizations are inherently time wasters. An action plan will prove unless useless unless it's allowed to determine how the executive spends his or her time. Action. Write down the time you believe you allocate to your various tasks and responsibilities in a typical week. Time management. The three steps. Effective executives start by finding out where their time actually goes. 
Effective executives do not start with their tasks. They start with their time. They do not start with their planning. They start by finding out where their time actually goes. Then they attempt to manage their time and cut back on productive demands on their time. Finally, they consolidate their discretionary, their discretionary time to the largest possible continuing units. This three-step process of time management is one recording time, managing time, and consolidating time is the foundation of the executive effectiveness. Questions. Do I start my work by planning my tasks or do I start by planning my time? The action. After, shift from first planning your tasks to first planning your time. Recording time. The first step towards the executive effectiveness is therefore to record actual time use. At a minimum, effective executives have to log and run on themselves three to four weeks at a stretch. After each such sample, they rethink and rework their schedule. Questions. Do I record the way I spend my time? How often do I record time usage? And what methods do I use? Am I utilizing today's technology effectiveness to categorize my activities? Actions. Create a time log by activity to determine where your time goes. You may want to ask an assistant to help you do this. Set a frequency to update your time log. An example, once a week or once a month. Eliminate time wasters. First, one tries to identify the eliminating the things that need not to be done at all. I have yet seen knowledge workers, regardless of rank or station, that could not consign something like a quarter of demands of his time to a waste paper basket without anybody noticing the disappearance. I have yet to see the knowledge worker regardless of rank or station who has not consigned something like a quarter of demands on his own time to the waste paper basket without anybody noticing disappearance. The question, find these time wasters by asking if each activity in my time record, record would have happened if this were not to have done at all. Find the time wasters by asking, of each activity in my time record, what would happen if this were not done at all? Action. Prune these activities. Don't worry about pruning too harshly. If you are too harsh, you will hear about it soon. Delegate activities. I have never seen a knowledge worker confronted by his time record who did not rapidly acquire the habits of pushing on to other people everything that needed not to do personally. The first look at the record makes it abundantly clear that there's just not time enough to do the things that the executive himself considers important, himself wants to do, and himself's committed to doing. The only way that he can get in important things is by pushing on others anything that can be done by them. Questions. Which of the activities on my time log could be done by somebody else just as fair well if not at all? To whom I can delegate these activities? Can technology help me save time tracking progress of delegated activities? How capable leaders blow it? How capable leaders blow it? One of the ablest men I've worked for in a long time back in Germany's last pre-World War II democratic counselor, Dr. Heinrich Brüning, he had an incredible ability to see the heart of a problem, which is very weak in financial manners. Should you delegate the time wasted endless hours on budget and performed poorly, it was able of terrible failing during the Depression that it led, it, and it led to Hitler. Never, never try to be an expert if you are not. Build your strengths and strong people. Do not the other necessarily tasks. Build on your strengths and find strong people to do the other necessary tasks. So build on your strengths. Actions. Do the most important things. Delegate anything that can be done by someone else. Try to utilize technology periodically to check on progress of delegated activities. Wasting time of other people. What do I do that wastes your time without contributing to your effectiveness? What do I do that wastes your time? The manner of which an executive does productive work may be a major waste of somebody else's time. The senior financial executive in large organizations knew perfectly well that the meeting of his offices was just a lot of waste of time. This man also asked in his direct subordinates to every meeting whatever the topic. As a result, the meetings were far too large. Because of the participation felt that he had to show an interest, everybody asked at least one question. Most of them are relevant. And as a result, the meeting stretched on endlessly, but the senior executive had not known until he asked that his subordinates to consider the meetings a waste of their time. Who have the great importance of everyone in the organization placed a status on being in the know? In the know, he had feared that the universal people would feel slightly and left out. The effective executive question, ask your colleagues, what do I do that wastes your time without contributing to your effectiveness. Actions. Eliminate all activities that waste the times of others. Prune activities resulting from poor management. Management. The definition of a routine is that what makes an unskilled people without judgment capable of doing what took near genius to do before. Is The definition of a routine is that it makes an unskilled people without judgment capable of doing what it took near genius to do before. Identify the time wasters from which now follow from a lack of a system of foresight. The sense system to look for the reoccurring crises and the crisis that comes before and years after year. A crisis that reoccurs a second time and a crisis that must not reoccur again. The annual inventory crisis belongs here. 
The reoccurring crises should always have been foreseen. It can therefore either be prevented or reduced to a routine which clerks and can be managed. The definition of a routine is that what makes an unskilled people without judgment capable of doing what it took a near genius to do before. For a routine put down in the systematic step-by-step -step form, what a very able man learned in his surmounting yesteryear's crises. The recurrent crises, the recurrent crisis is not confined to the lower levels of an organization. It affects everyone. Question. What are the recurrent crises that cause drama in my organization? Actions. For each reoccurring crisis, write out a procedure that solves the problem and assigns the application of a procedure to an appropriate person in the organization. Make sure the rule works permanently by checking it periodically. Overstaffing time waste often results from overstaffing. There is fairly reliable symptoms of overstaffing, and the senior people of the group spend more than a small fraction of the time, maybe one-tenth, on problems of human relations or feuds or frictions, on jurisdictional disputes and questions or cooperations, and so on. Then the workforce is almost certainly too large. People get into each other's way. People have to become independent of performance, impedent to performance, rather than the means thereto. In the lean organization, people have room for more without colliding with another and can do more work within of having to explain it all the time. Question. Are knowledge workers in my organization absorbed by these problems of human relations? Values. Another value bank one had was, we strive to be low, the lowest provider through efficiency and great operations. Some of the prescriptions behaviors include leaner is better, eliminate bureaucracy, cut waste reless, relentlessly, operations should be fast and simple, value each other's time, invest in infrastructure. We should know our business best. We don't need consultants to tell us what to do. Jack Welsh in Winning in the Harper Business, HarperCollins Publisher, 2005. Action. Create a lean organization in which people have room to move without colliding with one another. Malorganization. Another common time waster is malorganization. It's a symptom is an excess of meetings. Meetings are by definition a concession of deficient organizations. From one either one meets or one works. One cannot do both at the same time and ideally designing its structure, there would be no meetings. We would, because people were holding different jobs, also cooperate to get a specific task done. We meet because the knowledge of experience needed to be specific situations are not available in one ahead and have to pierce together once to experience a knowledge for several people. Questions. Do knowledge people in my organization spend more than a fairly small part of their time in meetings? Are these people able to learn a piece together the knowledge they need for, to work effectively? Actions. Consolidate the work of groups whose members meet excessively. Evaluate the purpose of each meeting. Drop these meetings without clear purpose. Malfunction in information. The last major time wasters in malfunction in information is the administrator of a large hospital was plagued for years for telephone calls from doctors asking him to find a bed for one of their patients who should be hospitalized. The admissions people knew that there was no empty bed, yet the administrator almost invariably found a few admin admissions. People simply were not informed immediately when the patient was discharged. The floor's nurse knew, of course, and so did the people in the front office, presented the bill of the departing of the patients. The admissions people, however, got a bed count, made every morning at 5 o'clock a.m. while the great majority of patients were being sent home in the mid-morning after the doctors had made the rounds. It did not take a genius to put this right. That all it needed was an extra copy of the chit that goes from the floor nurse to the front office. The effective executive. Questions. Do I receive data that is outdated and erroneous? How can the data be provided to be more accurately? Take steps to make Actions. Take step to make certain that the data you receive represents timely and accurate information that allows you to take the right action. Create and consolidate blocks of discretionary time. How much time is there in a discretionary? How much time is that is discretionary that is available on the big tasks which really make a contribution? The method by which one consolidates one's discretionary time is far less important than the approach. Most people tackle the job by trying to push the secondary, the less productive matters together, thus clearing, so to speak, a free space between them. Questions. Do I have a method or methods for creating and consolidating discretionary time? What is it? How much discretionary time per week have I been able to carve out? Actions. Use the process of recording time and pruning time wasters to create a significant blocks of discretionary time. Compare your time spent and what you thought you should spend your time on. Make sure that you give top priority to the best time to those activities from which you are paid. Effective use of discretionary time. All effective people work on their time management perpetually. They not only keep a continuing log to analyze it periodically, but they set themselves deadlines for important time activities based on their judgment and their discretionary time. One highly effective man I know keeps two such lists, one urgent and one unpleasant things that have to be done, each with a deadline. When he finds his deadline slipping, he knows it's time to again to getting away from him. When he feels his deadline slipping, he knows it's time is getting away from him again. 
Questions. Do I set priorities for the use of my discretionary blocks of time? Actions. Set deadlines for your discretionary blocks of time matters you consider important, as well as the matters you consider unpleasant. If you find these deadlines slipping, go back to the three steps of time management and recover the lost blocks of discretionary time. Chapter 3. Focus on Contribution. Introduction. To be effective, you must focus on contribution and ask yourself, what can I contribute that will significantly affect the performance and the results of an intuition I serve? And this should be followed by the question, and what self-development do I need to take and make this contribution today and in the future? A focus on contribution will almost always require you to shift away from your own specialty, skills, and department to what constitutes performance for your entire organization. This in turn requires you to focus on the outside where the results are for the organization. You should make high demands upon yourself because that's the way you will develop. You will grow according to the demands you make on yourself for achievement. If you demand little of yourself, you will remain stunted. If you demand a good deal of yourself, you will grow to giant stature. Embrace change. One thing that is certain is that tomorrow's opportunities will not look like today's. Affected people find themselves asking other people in the organization, their superiors, their subordinates, but above all, their colleagues in other areas, what contribution from me do you require to make your contribution to the organization? When do you need this? How do you need it? In what form? These questions underline the reality of a knowledge organization. Effective work is actually done in and by teams of people who diverse knowledges and skills. The Effective Executive, Chapter 3. Focus on contributions, results, values, and developing people. The Effective Person focuses on contribution. The focus of contribution is the key to effectiveness. It's the one of one's work, its content, its level, its standards, its impacts, its one relations with others, one's superiors, one's associates, one's subordinates, and one's use of tools and executives such as meeting or reports. The focus of the contribution turns the executive's attentions away from his own specialty, his own narrow skills, his own department, towards the performance of a whole. It turns his attention to the outside and the only place where there are results. Contribution may mean different things. For every organization, it, means it, me it needs performance in three major areas. It needs direct results, building of values, and their reaffirmation, and the building and developing of people for tomorrow. The effective executive. Questions. Do I spend my time and effort focusing on my own specialty, or do I seek to contribute to the overall mission of my organization? Action. Focus my contributions on the overall mission of the organization. Focus on results. What can I contribute that will significantly affect the performance and the results of an intuition I, of an institution I serve? The effective person focuses on contribution. He looks up from his work and outward towards the goals. He asks, what can I contribute that will significantly affect the performance and the results of my intuition and I serve? His stress is on responsibility. The effective executive questions, am I focused on efforts or results for my position? Is my focus outward in the performance of the whole? What should I contribute? Throughout history, the great majority of people have never asked the question, what should I contribute? They were always told to contribute to their tasks were de dedicated and dictated either by the work itself or as if it were a peasant or an artisan, or by a master or a mistress, as if it were for domestic servants. There is no return to hold to the old answer. In doing what you are told or assigned to do, knowledge workers in particular have to learn the question that has not been asked before. What should my contribution be? To answer it, they must address three distinct elements. What does the situation require, given my strengths of the way am I performing, and my values, and how can I and my greatest contribution to what needs to be done? And I, finally, what results have to be achieved to make the difference? Peter F. Drucker, Harvard Business Review. Level 5 Leadership. Level 5 leaderships are fanatically driven and affected with the incurable need to produce sustained results. They are involved in whatever it takes to make the company great, no matter how big or hard the decisions. The power of positive surprise. When most people think about developing a sensation performance, they're imagining beating agreed upon performance goals. That's all well and good, but an even more effective way to get promoted is to expand your job's horizon to include bold and unexpected activities. Come up with a new concept or process that doesn't just improve your results, but your unit's results and company's overall performance. Actions. List a number of contributions that you can make in an organization to compare these with the contributions that you are currently making. Contribution of knowledge workers. Knowledge workers who do not ask themselves, what can I contribute, are not only likely to aim too low, but they are likely to aim at the wrong things. Above all, they may define your contribution too narrow. Question. How do I define my task? How do I define my task? Action. Take time now and define your task broadly so that you aim high and aim too high and to aim at doing the right thing. 
three key performance areas. All three have to be built into the contribution of every executive. The three performance areas. Every organization needs performance in three major areas and the three direct results, building of values and their reaffirmations, and building and developing people for tomorrow. Results, values, and building people for tomorrow. If deprived of performance in any of these areas, it will decay and die. All three, therefore, have to be built into the contribution of every executive. Effective executive. Question. How do I affect each of these three performances areas by my performance? Actions. Rank the importance of these three performance areas of your position. Identify the steps that you can take to improve your contributions to one or more of these three areas. Keep the track of your progress. Direct results. The direct results of any organizations are clearly visible as a rule in a business that they are economically results such as sales or profits. In a hospital they are patient care and so on. Questions. What are the direct results of my position? Are direct results of my position ambiguous? How do I measure or assess direct results? Action. Think through the best quantitative measures and qualitative assessments of direct results, even where direct results are ambiguous for your position. Use these measurements to assess your results and eliminate any confusion about the results that now exist. And for what does the organization stand? For what does the organization stand? Any organization also needs a commitment values for their constant reaffirmation. As a human body needs vitamins and minerals, there needs to be something this organization stands for, or else it degenerates into a deorganization confusing and paralysis. Questions. For what values does my organization stand? Am I satisfied for where the values are? Walked out amongst employee customers, suppliers in the community? Are there any symptoms of confusion and paralysis caused by the lack of commitment to the values? Do I uphold my organization's values? Actions. If your values are healthy ones, take steps to continuously reaffirm them to your employees, customers, and suppliers. Make sure your organization stands for something useful to society. Executive succession. An organization that is not capable of perpetuating itself has failed. An organization that's not capable, capable of perpetrating, per, perpetuating itself has failed. An organization that is not capable of perpetuating itself has failed. An organization there has to provide today men and women who can run it tomorrow. It has to renew the human capital, steadily upgrade the human resources. An organization which has perpetuates today's level of vision, excellence, and accomplishments has lost the capacity to adapt. And since one of the only things certain is human affairs is change, it will not be capable of survival in a changing tomorrow. Question. Does my organization have a systematic process for identifying and developing new human talent to meet the new needs of tomorrow? De Level 5 Leadership. Level 5 Leadership sets up on the successors for the greater success in the next generation, whereas egocentric Level 4 leaders often set up the successors for failure. Human resources elevate HR to a position of power and primacy for organization to make an HR people have the special qualities to help managers build leaders and careers. In fact, the best HR types of pastors and parents in the same package. Jack Welch winning Harper Business. Actions. Make a recommend change to an executive succession process in your organization today to meet the challenges posed by a rapid change. Focus on contribution and people development. People adjust to the level of demands made on them. Focus on the contribution by itself as a powerful force of developing people. People adjust to the levels of demands made on them. One who sets his sights on contribution raises the sight standards of everyone with whom he works. Commitment and contribution is commitment to the responsible effectiveness. Without it, a man shortchanges himself and deprives his organization and cheats the people he works with. Questions. What circumstances have led me to grow in the most of the profession grow my most in my professional life? What roles have my expectations and the expectations of others played in my professional growth? How dedicated am I to making a commitment to my organization that I view as a stretch? Actions. Once you've identified your strengths and strengths of subordinates, insist that they all meet high expectations by utilizing these strengths to the fullest. Challenges and contribution. The failures worked much harder in any good cases. The men who succeeded in World War II, Washington, focused on contribution. As a result, they changed both of what they did and the relatively weight they gave to each of the value dimension in their work. The failures worked much harder in good many cases, but they did not challenge themselves, and they failed to see the need for redirecting their efforts. Questions. Am I focused on the right results, those that will make a difference in my performance in my organization? What can I do that no one else can do which I'm done really well and would make a difference in this organization? Actions. Challenge yourself. Redirect your efforts to enhance your contribution and work smarter. Executive failure. The most common cause of executive failure is inability or unwillingness to change with the demands of a new position. The knowledge worker who keeps on doing what he has done successfully before moved is almost bound to fail. 
Questions. What are the results for my position from which a contribution ought to be directed? Has there been relative performance between the three dimensions of performance changed recently in my position? Am I trying to replicate my newest assignment and in activities I perform to my old one? Actions. Assume the patterns of behavior that I got in my new responsibilities are wrong with the current responsibilities. Figure out the right things to do in your position and the right way to do them. Communicating knowledge. Person of knowledge has always been expected to take responsibility for being understood. It is barbarian arrogance to assume that the layman can should make the effort to understand him. That is not enough for a man of knowledge talks to a handful of fellow experts who are his peers. Questions. Do I maximize the use of my knowledge to make contributions to the organization when... When appropriate, do I effectively communicate my knowledge to others? Take responsibility for communicating. Effective executives make sure that both their action plans and their information needs are understood. Each executive must identify the information he needs, ask for it, and keep pushing until he gets it. Actions. Ask other people in the organization, your superiors, your subordinates, your colleagues, and other areas, what contributions from me do you require to make your contributions to the organization? When do you need this? How do you need it? In what form? What's your specialized knowledge very accessible to those who depend upon it in their jobs? Good human relations. The focus on contribution by itself supplies the four basic requirements of effective human relations. Knowledge workers in the organization do not have good human relations because they have a talent for people. They have good human relations because they focus on contributions in their own work and in their relationships with others. The focus of the, on contribution by itself supplies the four basic requirements of effective human relations. Communications teamwork, self-development, and development of others. Question. What are the contributions for which my organizations and my superiors should hold me accountable? The flywheel and the doom loop. The good to great leaders spent essentially no energy to create alignment, motivate the troops, or manage change. Under the right conditions, the problems of commitment, alignment, motivation, and change largely take care of themselves. Alignment principally follows from results and momentum, not the other way around. Jim Collins, good to great. Why some companies make the leap and others don't. Actions. Work with your superiors, colleagues, and subordinates to develop and maximize your collective contributions. Create a high-spirit team. Communications. Communications are practically impossible if they are based on the downward, downward relationships. The harder the superior tries to say something to his or his subordinates, is more likely the subordinate will mishear. He or she will hear what he or she expects to hear rather than what is being said. Questions. Do I demand that my subordinates take responsibility that their contributions is in their work? How do I communicate with the superiors and subordinates? Are they downward or upward and or, or are they parallel? Actions. Hold your subordinates accountable for communications. Fully utilize your subordinates' knowledge and abilities. Utilize your responsibility for contribution as the basis for communication. Teamwork. The focus on contribution leads to communication sideways and makes teamwork possible. The question, who has the use of my output for it is to become for it to become effective. Immediately show up the importance of people who are not in line with the authority, either upward or downward, from and in the individual executive. It underlines what is the reality and the knowledge of the organization. The effective work is actually done in and by teams of people of diverse knowledges and skills. Question. Does the knowledge workers in my organization work together voluntarily according to their demands of the task, or do we accordingly to a formal reporting relationships? How organizations fall down. Make sure the people with whom you work understand the priorities where organizations fall down, where they have the guess what the boss is working at and the invariable guess is wrong. So the CEO needs to say, this is what I am focusing on. The CEO needs to ask the associates, what are you focusing on? Are the associates to put on the top of the priority list? Why? The reason may be the right one, but it also may be that the associates of your salesman who persuades that his priorities are correct and when they are not. So make sure that you understand your associates' priorities and make sure that you have that conversation. You sit down and drop them a two-page note. This is what I think we discussed. This is what I think we decided. This is what I think you committed yourself to within the last time frame. Finally, ask them, what do you expect from me as to seek to achieve your goals? Interviewed by Richard Carl Gard, Peter Drucker on Leadership, Forbes.com. Action. Establish a necessary communication so they understand your colleagues and know each other's needs, goals, and ways of doing things. Do not rely only on written means of communication for creating effective communications. Individual self-development. Individual self-development in a large measure depends on the focus of contributions. The man who asks of himself, what is the most important contribution that I can make to the performance of this organization ask and effect? What self-development do I need? What knowledge of skill do I need to acquire to make the contribution I should be making? What strengths do I have to put to my work? What standards do I have to set myself? 
Questions. What self-development knowledge and skill do I need to acquire to make an effective contribution to my organization? How can I use the knowledge and skill to my responsibilities? Actions. Develop a plan to obtain the knowledge and skill required to make the optimum contribution to your organization. Strive for excellence. Develop others. The executive who focuses on contributions also stimulates others to the development in themselves, whether they are subordinates, colleagues, or superiors. He sets a standard of which is not personal but grounded in the requirements of a task. At the same time, they are in demand excellence, for they are in demand of high aspirations for ambitious goals and for good work of great impact. The effective executive, page 6869. Questions. Do I demand that my subordinates achieve outstanding results? Do I provide all the necessary tools and opportunities for my people to grow in stature? Do I welcome subordinates who are stronger than I am? Actions. Develop and implement a plan whereby each of your subordinates is encouraged to develop their full potential. Make meetings productive. The key to running an effective meeting is to decide in advance what kind of meeting it will be. Different kinds of meetings require different forms of preparation, different results. A meeting to prepare a statement or an announcement or a press release. One member must prepare the draft beforehand to the meeting's end. A pre-appointed member has taken responsibility for disseminating the final test. Disseminating the final test. A meeting to make an announcement, for example, an organizational change. This meeting should be confined to an announcement and discussion about it. A meeting in which one member reports. Nothing but the report should be discussed. A meeting in which several or all members report, discussion should be limited to clarification at the kind of meeting all reports should be limited to a preset time. A meeting whose only function is to allow the participants to be in the executive's presence. Senior executives are effective to the extent to which they can prevent such meetings from encroaching on their work days. Peter F. Drucker, what makes an effective executive? Question, do I conduct meetings according to the kind of meeting it should be? How to lead a 21st century organization. Don't travel so much. Organize your travel. It is important that you see people and that you are seen by people maybe once or twice a year. Otherwise, don't travel. Make them come see you. Use technology. It is cheaper than traveling. The second thing to say is to make sure that your subsidiaries of foreign offices take up responsibility to keep you informed. So ask them twice a year. What activities do you need to report to me? Also ask them, what about my activity and my plans do you need to know from me? Interviewed by Carl by Rich Callgard, Forbes.com. Actions. Prepare for and conduct meetings according to the kind of their objectives. Effective meetings. The effective person always states in the outside of the meeting specific purpose of contributions it's to achieve. He makes it to the meeting, addresses itself to this purpose. He does not allow a meeting called from form to degenerate into a bull session in which everyone has bright ideas. Questions. This kind of meeting do I conduct most often? What kind of meeting do I conduct most often? How effective are they? Actions. State the special purposes of a special contribution expect from each meeting. Determine what kind of meeting it should be and then stick to the appropriate format. Terminate the meeting as soon as specific purposes have been accomplished and don't raise additional matters for discussion. Sum up the meeting and actions to be taken and adjourn. Follow up to make sure the actions agreed upon in the meeting is taken. 4. Making strength productive. Your task as an executive is to multiply the performance capacity of individuals in your organization. This means you should make staffing decisions based upon a person, what a person can do, and then demand that he and that that person do it. You cannot build on weaknesses, yours, your bosses, your others. Therefore, make staffing decisions so as to maximize strengths. Maximize strengths. This does not mean that you should ignore weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. Rather, you should place a person in the position where his or her strengths can be fully utilized, where the presence of the weaknesses will not harm or harm the performance, either in that position or in the organization as a whole. There is one exception to the rule of building on strengths and covering weaknesses. Character and integrity do not accomplish anything by themselves, but their absence faults everything else. Here, therefore, is one of the areas from where weaknesses is disqualifications by itself rather than a limitation on a performance capacity and strength. Concentrate on raising the performance of one leader rather than raising the performance of an entire organization. If the performance of your leadership group is high, the average will tend to go up. Therefore, make sure that you put a leadership position of the person who has the strength to do an outstanding job. This requires that you focus on the strengths of that person and dismiss his or her weaknesses as irrelevant unless they are harmful to the full development of the person's strengths. Finally, think about your own strengths and those of your bosses and whom you know you who, who well to help you identify your strengths. Work at a plan of continuous learning whereby further development of these strengths. In the same way, do all that you can to make the strengths of your bosses productive by reinforcing their strengths and by shielding them from the effects of their weaknesses. Purpose of the organization. To make the strength productive, it is unique purpose of the organization. To make strength productive, 
To make strength productive is the unique purpose of the organization. The effective executive makes strength productive. He knows the one cannot build on weaknesses. To achieve the results, he has to use all the available strengths, the strengths of associates, the strengths of superiors, one's own strengths, the strengths of true opportunities. To make the strength productive is the unique purpose of the organization. The task of an executive is not to change human beings. Rather, as the Bible tells us to parable of the talents, to talk and multiply the performance of the capacity of a whole by putting to use whatever strength, whatever health, whatever aspiration there is in an individual questions am I attempting to understand the strengths of my colleagues my subordinates and my boss what are these strengths how can I put these strengths to their highest use of my organization actions raise the performance capacity of people in your organization by placing them in positions from which their strengths their energy levels and their aspirations are staff from strength the effective executive fills positions and promotes on the basis of what a man can do. He does not make staffing decisions to minimize workness, weakness, by, but to maximize strength. Questions. In fulfilling positions, do I seek people who have specific strengths for the assignment? Or do I look for people who are well-rounded without glaring weaknesses? Actions. Concentrate on which potential candidates can do and determine whether these strengths and the right strengths are for particular assignments. Weaknesses in people. Where are peaks? Where there are peaks, there are valleys. Strong people always have strong weaknesses too. There are weaks, peaks, and valleys, and no one is strong in many areas. And no one is strong in many areas measured against the universe of human knowledge, experience, and abilities. Even great geniuses, geniuses would have been rated a total failure. Performance can only be built on strength. What matters most is the ability to do the assignment. Questions. Am I a perfectionist? Do I treat weaknesses as candidates and limitations or an automatic disqualifier? What are my strengths? At the time of feedback will also reveal the problem of the lack of the manners. Manners are lubricated over the organization. It is the law of nature of two moving bodies in contact with each other to create friction. This is true with human beings. It's inanimate objects, manners, simple things like saying please and thank you, knowledge of a person's name, or asking his or her family enable two people to work together whether they like each other or not. Bright people, especially bright young people, often do not understand this. If analysis shows something brilliant, someone's brilliant work fails again and again as soon as a cooperation from others is required, it probably indicates a lack of courtesy. That is, a lack of manners. Harvard Business Review. Actions. Look at the best performing person in your organization. What weaknesses are evident in that person? Seek to remedy those weaknesses in yourself and others that are easily remedied, such as bad manners. Look for outstanding strength. Effective executives never ask, how does he get along with me? The question is, is what does he contribute? The question is never, what can a man, what, what can a man not do? The question is always, is what can he do uncommonly well? In staffing, they look for excellence in one major area, not for performance that gets by all around questions do I look for strong performance in relatively few areas that matter to one assignment or is my primary question how will he or she get along with me actions look for what the person can do uncommonly well and ask if the strength matches the strength required to in the assignment do not look in excellence across the board in a candidate focus on the assignment not on the relationship make each job demanding and big the second rule of staffing from strengths is to make each job demanding and big it should have challenges bring out whatever strengths a person may have it should have scope to that any strength is the relevant the task to produce significant results. Only if a job is big and demanding to begin with will it enable a person to rise with new demands of a changed situation. Questions. Do I place high demands upon people who have demonstrated real strengths for the assignments I have given them? Actions. Start out with what a person should be able to do well and then demand that he or she really do the assignment well. Make high demands and push for excellence. Make weaknesses irrelevant. In an organization, one who makes strengths effective and weaknesses irrelevant. In an organization, one can make strength effective and weaknesses irrelevant. We can structure the organization that the weaknesses become personal blemish. We can structure as to make the strength relevant. A good tax accountant is to private practice which is greatly hampered is by the inability to get along with people but in an organization such as a man who can set up an office in his own shield of direct contact with other people there are others who get along with people first-rate tax accountants are a good deal rarer the effective executive questions how can I make a strength of each person in my organization effective while making his or her weaknesses irrelevant actions identify weaknesses of your people and develop an organization structure that maximizes their collective strengths and shields the organization from any serious weaknesses job structure to fit personalities structuring jobs to fit personalities is almost certain to lead to favoritism and conformity 
and no organization can afford either. It needs equity and impersonal fairnesses and personal decisions. It needs diversity, or else it will lack the ability to change the ability for dissect and dissent, which is the right decision demands. Questions. Do I seek human diversity in filling the positions of my organization? How do I go about it? Is it based upon race, color, creed, national origin, na national origin, or based upon diversity strengths required of achieving outstanding performances? Is it based on a question, is he or she the person most likely to do an outstanding job? Actions. Structure jobs impersonally without respect to any of these strengths the individual brings to perform the assessments required to buy these jobs. Decision steps for effective staffing decisions. There are five decision steps to making strength productive throughout the effective staffing decisions. Number one, carefully think through the assignment. Number two, look at all several qualified people. Number three, study performance records to determine what each candidate has done well. Number four, discuss candidates with those who have worked with them. Number five, make sure the appointee understands the assignment. Questions, do I follow the systematic procedure for the selecting people opening positions? What is my success rate in the staffing decisions? Actions, follow steps one through five above the making staffing decisions. If you depart from these steps, make sure that there is a compelling reason to do so. Think through the assignment. Job descriptions may last a long time, but job assignments change all the time, often unpredictably. The job description of a general commanding as a division has changed since the time of Napoleon, but the assignment may be trained a division of raw recruits, or it may be a commander division of combat. Questions. Do I seek staff opening positions from which a person who best fits the general job description for the position, or do I seek a person who demonstrated strength to perform the specific assignment? Action. Think about the primary assignment of the person who will occupy a vacant position that you are now seeking to fill. Consider several qualified people. Formal qualifications, such as a listed of a resume, personal file, job posting, a newspaper, are also no more the starting point. Their absence disqualifies or a candidate. The most important thing is that a person and an assignment to fit each other. To find the best fit, you must consider at least three to five candidates. Question. What role of formal qualifications, such as the listed in the resume, fit the job requirements and strengths the candidate play in a my people selection process? Actions. Consider several qualified people for each position to make sure the person selected in the assignment fit each other. Study the performance records of the candidates. The things a person cannot do with little performance, instead you must concentrate on the thing that they can do and determine whether or not the right strengths for the particular assignment are. Now check, for weaknesses are only limitations. Weaknesses are only limitations, are like the absence of formal qualifications, but they can rule a candidate out, for performances can only be built on strengths. The matter is mostly the ability to do the assignment. Questions, do I rule out people based upon their weaknesses, or do I rule them out because the absence of specific strengths required for the position? Actions. When fulfilling a position, concentrate on the things the candidate has done well. Determine whether or not the candidate has done well and well of the right things for the assignment. And discuss candidates with former colleagues. One person's judgment alone is worthless. One person's judgment alone is worthless. By asking additional opinions, you can learn about the strengths impressed others yet and not noticed by you. But you can also likely discover the weaknesses and limitations you haven't noticed. The best information often, come, often comes through informal discussions with the candidate's former bosses or colleagues. Questions. Do I realize? and do rely on one person's judgments for an evaluating past performance of a candidate? Or do I rely on both formal and informal discussions with the candidate's bosses and colleagues? Do I compare my evaluations with others in my organization who have interviewed the candidate? Actions. Ask for multiple opinions about a candidate that you can learn about the strengths and impress others from which you have not noticed from yourself. You may discover weaknesses and limitations you haven't even noticed. Appointee should understand the assignment. Although this is the last step in making people decisions, it may be the most important if you fail to accept the responsibility of making sure that the appointee understands his or her new job. Do not blame the new person if he or, she, he or she ultimately fails. Blame yourself, for you have failed to do your duty as a manager. The best way to do this is to ask the new person carefully. Think over what they have to do to be successful, and then 90 days into the job, have him or her commit it in writing. Questions. Have I asked the new appointee their understanding of the appointee? Did I get it in writing? Do I blame the new person if he or she is ultimately fails? Or do I blame myself for failing to do my duty as a manager? Action. Accept responsibility for making sure that the appointee understands his or her new job. Five ground rules for effective staffing decisions. There is no such thing as a perfect record for making people decisions. However, executives who take their people decisions seriously and work hard in getting them right come close to perfection. In addition, the five steps of people decisions, every successful executive follows five ground rules. Number one. The executive must accept responsibility for any placement that fails. Number two, the executive does have the responsibility to remove people who do not perform. 
Part three. Number three. Just because people doesn't perform in the job doesn't mean that that person is bad worker from the organization. Organization should let go. Number four. The executive must try to make the right people decisions for every position. Number five. Newcomers are best put in establishment position where the expectations are known and help is available. Questions. Which of the staffing grounds rules do you follow? Which do you ignore? Actions. Aim for perfection is your staffing recommendation and decisions will organize, organize, re recognizing that perfection will elude you. Follow the five ground rules of actions. Aim for perfection in your staffing recommendations and decisions while recognizing that perfection will elude you. And follow the five ground rules. Responsibility for failed placements. The executive must accept responsibility for any fla fails of placement. The blame is not performer. It's not the non-performer as a cop-out. The executive made a mistake is selecting the particular person. The, ex the executive made a mistake in selecting that particular person. Question. Do I tend to blame a non-performer for my mistake in placement? How long does it take now if you have hired right? How long does it take now if you've hired right? Usually within a year, and certainly within two. It is pretty clear if someone is getting the results you'd hope for. Don't beat yourself up in hiring the wrong of some of them all the time. Just remember the mistakes is yours to fix. Jack Welch and winning. Action. Take responsibility for the mistake if you were the only one who made the appointment that resulted in the failure. Responsibility for removing non-performers. The soldier has a right to competent command. There is an old military saying, the soldier has a right to competent command. Incompetent to poor performer when left in his or her job pen penalizes all others and demoralizes the entire organization. And it is also of no favor of the non-performers to be allowed to stay in the job that they are not right for. They know that they are not performing. Questions. Does my enterprise have the habit of leaving poor performers in his or her job? Do non-performers demoralize those who depend upon their performance? Actions. Make sure non-performers know that the non-performance steps to take to remove these non-performers and then help them get placed where the strengths can be made productive. Help them do so by providing them with the candid feedback from which they need to make the next step in their careers. Right people decisions for every position. Try to make the right people decisions for every position in an organization can only perform to capacity of its individual workers. Thus, people decisions must be right. There are dead-end jobs. There are dead-end jobs, but there are also no unimportant jobs. Questions. How close is my organization to performing at an optimal level? Which of the deficits is the results of my people's decisions of the organization? Actions. Raise the level of performance of my organizations by trying to make the right people decisions for every position. A second chance. Just because a person doesn't perform a job that he or her he or she has been put in doesn't mean that that person is a poor worker whom the organization should let go. It only means that he or she is in the wrong job. Questions. Does my organization give people a second chance in another job to better fit their strengths? If so, what is the success rate of these people in a second job? People who have failed in a new job should be given a choice to go back to the job for their former level of salary. The very existence of the option can be a powerful effect of encouraging people to leave safe, comfortable jobs to take a new risky assignment. The organization performs depends on the employee's willingness to take such chances. Systematic decision reviews by a powerful tool of self-development too. Checking the result of decisions against expectations shows executives what their strengths are, where they need to improve, and where their lack of knowledge of information. It shows, from them, their, it shows them their biases. What makes an effective executive? First, who, then, what? When you know you need to make a people change, act corollarily. First, be sure that you don't have someone in the wrong seat. From good to great. Finding a job you haven't, you have been let go. Finding a job after you've been let go. The goal if you've been let go is to stay out of what you've always referred to as the vortex of defeat, in which you let yourself spiral into an inertia of despair. Actions. Consider a policy of placing non-performers into another position within an organization after a detailed appraisal of their strengths and the requirements for a second position. Keep careful track of the success rates for these second chances. Place newcomers in established positions. New major assignments should be mainly go to people whose behaviors and habits are well known and those who have already earned trust and credibility. The common practice of hiring somebody from the outside to fill a new job is much too risky. No wonder it has extraordinary high failure rate and well over 50%. Question. Do my major new assignments in my organization go to people whose behavior and habits are well known or from who have ready earned trust and credibility? Effective executives put their best people on the opportunities rather than on problems. 
First who, then what. Put your best people on your biggest opportunities, not your biggest problems. Jim Collins, good to great. Action. Give the extra risk associated with a major new assignment. Whenever possible, consider making these appointments from the inside. Appraise based on strengths. Performance appraise starts on the statements of the major contributions expected on the people in the past, present positions, and to record a performance against these goals. Then it also asks six questions. A. What has he done well? B. What, therefore, is he likely to be able to do well? C. What does he have to learn to acquire to be able to get the full benefit of his strengths? D. If I had a son or daughter, would I be willing to have him or her work under the work under the work under this person? I. If yes, why? If no, why? Questions. Does the performance of appraisal process in my organization start by focusing on strengths? Does it begin with my person, what a person can do? Does it view weaknesses and limitations to the full use of the strengths and achievement, effectiveness and accomplishment? Actions. In performance appraisal, emphasize, ex emphasize expected performances based on the person's strengths. Define what a person must learn to full capitalize upon his or her strengths. Suggest ways to remedy any weaknesses that presently hinder the full development of a person's strengths. Character and integrity. Subordinates, especially bright, young, and ambitious ones, tend to mold themselves after a forceful boss. There is therefore nothing more corruptible than destructive than organization than a forceful but basically corrupt executive. Such a person might do well, operative, effective on his own, even within an organization, but he might be tolerable and denied by all power over others. But in the position of power within an organization, he destroys. He, therefore, is in the area from which is the weakness itself and its important importance and relevance. Questions. Do topic... Do top executives in my organization tolerate a lack of character and integrity in a leader? Do I realize that the character of integrity by themselves do not accomplish anything, but their absence faults everything else? Character development. We have all talked about a lot about effective executive development. We have mostly been talking about developing people's strengths and giving them experiences. Character is not developed in that way. This is developed inside, not outside. I think churches and synagogues, the 12-step recovery programs, main development against agents of character today. Character traits. Why do your definition of right people to focus more on the character attributes of person here see less specialized knowledge? People can learn skills and acquire knowledge, but they cannot learn the essential character traits that make them right for the organization. Actions. Do not appoint anyone to a leadership position whose character and integrity are corrupted. How do I manage my boss? Everyone has a boss, or almost everybody, and the most of have at least one boss. The human resources person finds when the team has at least two. The HR manager put his or her team and a manager of teams. Division controller of big companies has at least two bosses. The company's chief accounting and the chief financial officer and division manager tends to for knowledge workers to have an increasingly number of bosses, increasing number of people who have approval and appraisal they depend from which they support and they need. So the boss is not only the person for key for pay, promotion and placement, he or she also the person for knowledge of the worker's effectiveness. No matter how good in knowledge the workers work, the boss does not act on it. Nothing will happen. Nothing will get done. Here, in the readings that follow, are seven keys to success in managing bosses. Questions. How important have high-performance bosses have been in my own effectiveness and career? Have I ever thought about what it would take to manage my bosses? Action. Make it one of my highest priorities to help my bosses become as effective as they can be. A boss list. First thing to do is make a boss list. Put down a piece of paper of everyone whom you are accountable. Everyone whom you direct you as people. Whom whom you or your people, everyone who appraises you and your work for it's expected to have an opinion about your performance, everyone is whom you depend to make it effective for your work and whom your people, and revise a list once a year and always make your job more to your assignment changes. It's unlikely to be the same list for longer than a year or so. Question. Who has the power and likely to be listed from which he or she has an opinion about me? My performance, my work, my competence and qualifications? Actions. Drop a boss list and remember it. It is better to have a few more people in the boss list than to take them off and rather to leave off people who should be on it. Input from bosses. Second, ask each one of the bosses for him or her input and give each input and ask each person, what do I do and what do my people do that helps you do your job? And what do we do all hampers you and makes your life more difficult for you? Questions. What do I do with my people that helps you and my boss list to do their job? What do those on my boss list do hampers me and makes my job more difficult? Actions. Review your boss list. Identify what each person does and hamper your performance for your job. Let those bosses know what hampers you and what you do or don't do that hampers them.
managing oneself. The average knowledge worker will outlive the average employee organization. Few business, for instance, is or successful for more than 30 years. But the working life expectancy of a knowledge worker is more likely to be 50. And so, for the first time in the history, more and more people are out going to outlive their employing employing organizations. And this means something totally new and unprecedented. Knowledge workers have now taken the responsibility for managing themselves. No one or very few super achievers, a Mozart, for instance, an Einstein, and Edison, even dreamed in the past of such auto autonomy and responsibility. Questions. The knowledge capital I possess makes me a capitalist. Have I accepted responsibility for managing my human capital? What are my strengths? We live in a age of unprecedented opportunity, and if you've got ambition and smarts, you can rise to the top of your chosen profession, regardless of where you started out. But the opportunity comes from responsibility. Companies today aren't managing their employees' careers, knowledge workers must effectively, and their own chief executive officers. It's up to you to carve out your own place, to know when to change course, and to keep yourself engaged to productive during productivity and productive work during the life of the span of some 50 years. To do those things well, you need to cultivate a deep understanding of yourself, not only the strengths and weaknesses also, but also in what you've learned and how you work with others, with your values, and where you can make the greatest contribution. Because only when you operate from strength can you achieve true excellence. Action. Take responsibility for actively managing your knowledge, capital, and your career. Step for managing yourself. Step for managing oneself. Managing oneself requires you to identify your strengths, recognize your work style, determine how you make your best contribution, take responsibility for work relationships, and develop opportunities for a second half of your life. Identifying your strengths. All in all, the effective executive tries to be himself. He does not pretend to be someone else. He looks at his own performance and his own results and tries to discern a pattern. What are the things, he asks, that I could seem to be able to do with my relative ease while they come, rather than hard to other people? That I seem to be able to do with my relative ease. He asks, what are the things that I seem to be able to do with relative ease while they come rather hard to other people? Questions. What am I good at? How have I determined what I am good at? What are my strengths? Several implications for action follow the feedback analysis. First and foremost, concentrate on your strengths. Put yourself where strengths can produce results. Secondly, work on improving your results and analyze rapidly. Show how you need to improve your skills and acquire new ones. It would also show the gaps of your knowledge and those can be usually be filled. Mathemat mathematicians are born, but everyone can learn trigonometry. Third, discoveries. Third, discover where your intellectual arrogance is causing disability, ignorance, and overcome it. Far too many people, especially those with expertise in one area, are contemptuous. Are contemptuous in knowledge of other areas to believe in what might be a bright substitute for knowledge. Go to work in acquiring the skills and knowledge you need to fulfill and fully realize your strengths. What are my values? Do not try to change yourself. You are unlikely to succeed. But work hard to improve the way you perform. Try not to take on work you cannot perform or only will perform poorly. Actions. Use feedback analysis to determine your strengths. Write down every one of your key decisions and make actions along the results that will expect that you expect it to help you expect to achieve them. Nine of the twelve months later, check the actual results again and expectations. After time of the following procedure, you should know your strengths by tracking your decisions and actions where the action where the actual results fell in line with or exceeded expectations. Recognize your work style. It is not very difficult to know how we achieve results. By the time you reach adulthood, one has a pretty good idea of how whether or not one works better in the morning or at night. One knows whether one works as well as a member with a committee or better alone. Some works under pressure, others work if they have a good idea of time and finish a job before the deadline. Some are readers, others are listeners. All this one knows about oneself. All this one knows about oneself. Questions. What is my work style? Do I like work alone or with co-workers? Do I like to work to be structured or do I like to thrive constantly on changing work environments? Do I thrive under pressure? How do I learn? Am I a reader or a listener or both? Actions. Figure out your work style and describe the characteristics and use it to increase your effectiveness. Make sure that you fully utilize technolo technology to enhance your work style. Make sure you fully utilize technology to enhance your work style. Determine how best to make your contribution. One person finds it easy to write up a final report while many others find it frightening chore as a frightening chore and at the same time however write up and write up your final report on on your contribution it finds rather difficult and 
it's actually unrewarding to think through the reports and face up to the hard decisions. But this person is, in other words, more effective as a staff thinker who organizes and lays out the problems than as a decision maker who takes command responsibility. The effective executive looks upon people, including himself, as an opportunity. He knows that only strength produces results. Strength. Questions. What assignments will enable me to use my strengths, match my work style, and fit within my value system? How do I perform? One should waste a little effort and possible improving areas of low competence. It takes far more energy to work to improve more incompetence than mediocrity than it does to improve the first-rate performance to excellence. And yet, most people, especially teachers and organizations, concentrate making in incompetent performers into mediocre ones. Energy, resources, and time should go instead of making a competent person into a star performer. What are my values? To work in an organization whose value system is unacceptable or incomp incompatible with one's own condemns a person to both frustration and non-performance. Organizations like people have values. To be effective in an organization, a, pers a person's values must be compatible with the organization's values. They do not need to be the same, but they must be close enough to coexist. Otherwise, the person will not only be frustrated, but also not produce results. A person's strengths and the way that a person performs rarely conflict. The two are complementary. But there is sometimes a conflict between a person's values and his or her strengths, and which one does well, even very well and successful, may not fit with one's value system. In that case, the work may not appear to be worth devoting one's life to, or even a substantial portion thereof. Harvard Business Review, Managing Oneself. Take it as a good sign. The stuff of a job turns to your crank. The love of the work feels fun and the meaningfulness to you, and even touches something primal in your soul. Jack Welch and Winning. Be concerned if you need to put on a persona at work. Be concerned if you need to put on a persona at work. Jack Welch in winning. Actions. Think through how you could make the right contribution to your organization. Think through the requirements of your specific situation. Your greatest potential. Contribution and the results. You must be achieved. Accept opportunities that suit you and how you work. Take responsibility for your work, for your work relationships. Organizations are built on trust, and the trust is built on communications and mutual understanding. Thus, relationships' responsibility is crucial for the modern knowledge worker. Work relationships depends upon communications. Since communications is a two-way process, you should feel comfortable asking coworkers to think through and define their own strengths, work styles, and values. This takes responsibility in relationships. Questions. Within whom should I share my work plans, objectives, and goals? And why should I share them with these people? Who depends on me to share this information? And why do they depend on me? Responsibility for relationships. Managing yourself requires taking responsibility for relationships. This has two parts. The first is to accept the fact that other people are as much as individuals as you yourself are. They are perceivedly insisting on behaving like human beings. This means, that means that they too have their own strengths. They too have their own ways of getting things done, have their own values. And to be effective, therefore, you have to know the strengths, the performance modes, and the values of your co-workers. The second part of the relationship is taking responsibility for communication. Most of these conflicts arise in the fact that people do not know what other people are doing and how they do their work, or what contributes to other people are concentrating on and what results they expect. Organizations are no longer built on force, but on trust. The existence of trust between people does not necessarily mean that they like one another. It means that they understand one another. Taking responsibility for relationships is therefore an absolute ne necessity. It is a duty. Peter Drucker in managing oneself. Managing down. Manage your relationships with your subordinates with the same carefulness that you would manage with one with your boss. Think and say we. Effective executives know that they have an ultimate responsibility which can be either shared nor delegated, but they have an authority only because they have to trust the organization. This means that they think of the needs and opportunities of an organization before they think of their own needs and their opportunities. Actions. Take responsibility for your relationships by, number one, building on other people's strengths, other people's work styles, and other people's values to attain an effective group performance. Number two, letting others know the strengths, work styles, and values, as well as what contributions they should expect from you and by. Number three, providing them information they need in form they can understand and use. Develop opportunities for the second half of your life. Knowledge workers are able physically to keep up work into old age, and they are well beyond any traditional retirement age. They run a new risk. They may become mentally finished, what's commonly called a burnout, but the most commonly affliction of a 40-something knowledge worker is rarely, rarely the result of stress. It's common, all too common, causes boredom on the job. Managing oneself, therefore, requires that you perform for the second half of your life. Questions. Have I begun to prepare myself for the second half of my life? Do I need the challenge of doing something that is new and different? 
Have I been successful at my work but no longer feel challenged by it? Am I looking for new opportunities of leadership, success, and respect? What can I be doing right now to prepare myself for the second half of my life? Do I feel the need to give back to society as a result from my own success in life? The second half of your life. Knowledge workers outlive organizations and they are mobile. They need to manage oneself, therefore creating revolution in human affairs. How to reinvigorate people. Within organizations, there are people who typically are in their 40s, hit midlife crisis when they realize that they won't make it to the top and discover that they are not first rate. This happens to engineers, accountants, and technicians. The worst midlife crisis is on physicians. They all have several midlife crises. Basically, their work becomes awfully boring. Just imagine seeing another 30 years of people with skin rash. They have a midlife crisis, and that's when they take it to the bottle. How do you save these people? Give them a parallel change. Without that, they'll soon take to drinking and sleeping around. In a co-educational college, they sleep around and drink. Two things are not incompatible. A loss. Encourage people facing midlife crisis to apply their skills in a non-profit sector. Interview by Rich Calgard, Peter Drucker on leadership. From success to significance, one of the most common characteristics of peer persons who are nearing the end of his first half is the unquenchable desire to move from success to significance. After the first half of doing what we were supposed to do, we like to do something in the second half is more meaningful, something that rises above the perks and paychecks into the stratosphere of significance. Significance need to be about 180 degree course change. Instead, some retrofitting so that you can apply the gifts to ways that allow you to spend more time in the things related to what's in your box. And to do it in such a way to reclaim your thrill of that first deal. Halftime. Bob Buford in halftime. Actions. Consider a second career that provides some much needed change or consider a parallel career in a nonprofit organization that values you share. Consider starting and running a social sector organization that meets a need of society. List the goals that you are striving to achieve in your career outside of work or in a possible second career. Chapter 5. First Things First. Introduction. The secret of effectiveness lies in concentration of effort. You must make decisions that determine what matters most and, as a result, what comes first. This is how effective executives handle the reality that there is always more to do than time available, but it is in this way that the executive gets the most done, starting and finishing the most important task before starting the next, abandoning what is no longer productive in a major aid to setting priorities and making time to get the highest priority things done. And when to establish priorities, you are also forced to establish posture priorities. Posteriorities, posteriorities, those tasks that you postpone and perhaps even abandon. Finally, revise your priorities and your posteriorities in a light of new realities. It takes courage to stick to your decisions because of what's postponed is often someone else's top priority. If you let pressures make these decisions, you are likely to take a task that leads you away from major opportunities and away from the work of the top management, which is always postponable. The effective executive. Concentration. Concentration is necessarily necessary precisely because the executive faces so many tasks clamoring to be done. If there is any secret of effectiveness, it is concentration. Effective executives do first things first and they do one thing at a time. There are always more important contributions to be made than there is time available to make them. The more an executive focuses on upward contributions, the more the will the person requires fairly big continuous chunks of time. The more he or she switches from being busy to achieving results. The more a person will shift to sustaining effort. Similarly, the more an executive works at making strengths productive, the more the will the executive becomes conscious of the need to concentrate the human strengths available on major opportunities. This is the only way to get results. This is the secret of those people who do so many things and apparently so many difficult things. They do only one thing at a time. As a result, they need much less time in the end than the rest of us do. The people who are getting nothing done often work on great deal harder. They work a great deal harder and effective executives do not race. They set an easy pace and keep going steadily. Effective executives know that they have to get many things done, therefore to concentrate on doing one thing at a time and on doing first things first. Concentration, that is, is the courage to impose on time the events, his or, his or her decisions as to what really matters and comes first. It is the executive's only hope for becoming the master of time and events instead of their whipping boy. Questions. Do I try to accomplish multiple tasks at one time or do I concentrate on one thing at a time and move deliberately but not frantically through my priorities? Welch also thought through another issue before deciding where to concentrate his efforts for the next five years. He asked himself, which of the two or three tasks at the top of my list he himself was suited to undertake? Then he concentrated on the task, and other he delegated. Effective executives try to focus on jobs they'll do especially well. They know that enterprises perform if top management performs, and don't if it doesn't. 
Napoleon allegedly said, No successful battle ever follows its plan, yet Napoleon also planned every one of his battles far more meticulously than any other earlier general had. Without an action plan, the executive becomes a prisoner of events. Without check-ins to re-examine the plans as an events unfold, the executive has no way of knowing which events really matter and which ones are only noise. Action. Concentrate on doing one thing at a time and doing the highest priority tasks first. Abandonment. The first rule of concentration of executive efforts is to slow off the past that has ceased to be productive. Organized abandonment requires putting every product, every service, every process, every market, distribution channel and customer, and every use on trial for its life on a regular basis. Question. If I were not making particular products, performing specific services, or using a particular process, would I, knowing what I know now, do it now? Creative abandonment. A critical question for leaders is, is when do you stop pouring resources into the things that achieve their purposes? The most dangerous traps for leaders are those near successes where everybody says that if you just give it another big push, it will go over the top. One tries it once, one tries it twice, one tries it a third time, but by then, it should be obvious where this will be very hard to do. A culture of discipline, stop doing lists are more important than to-do lists. Stop doing lists are more important than to-do lists. Jim Collins on Good to Great, Why Some Companies Make a Leap and Others Don't. Number one or number two. The clarity of number one and number two came from the pair of very tough questions Drucker posed. If you weren't already in business, would you enter it today? And if the answer is no, then what are you going to do about it? Actions. Commit yourself to the practice of an organization abandonment. If the answer to the question above is no, act to make changes or an abandon the activity. Where abandonment is always right. Where abandonment is always right. There are at least three cases in which abandonment is always the right decision. The first of the productive service. The first is... The product, service, market, and process that still has some good years of life is clearly dying. The second is the asset no longer produces, and though it's fully written off. Finally, a third and most important case of maintaining an old and declining product, service, a market which will fall through the growth of a new product, service, so the market is being stunned or stunted. Questions. Which products, processes, or services in my organizations are clearly dying, which are no longer producing, and which are stunting the growth of a new product or service? Action. Abandon products, processes, services, and markets that are no longer serving their intended purpose. Consider establishing a formal abandonment process, such as the one on the next page. An abandonment process. An abandonment process. In one fairly big company offering and outsourcing servicing for the more developing countries, the first Monday morning of every month is aside from abandonment meeting at every management level, from the top management to the supervisors in each area. Each of these sessions examines the part of the business. One of the services Monday, one of the regions of which the companies does business a month later, the way this or that service is organized, the Monday morning of the third month, and so on. Within the year, the company has this way to examine the self completely, including people's policies, for instance. In the course of a year's time, a four major decisions are likely to be made on what of the company's services and perhaps twice as many decisions to change the how. But also each year, three of five ideas from new things do come out of these sessions. These decisions to change anything, whether to abandon something, whether to abandon the way something is being done, or whether to do something new. Are they reported each month to all members of management, and twice a year, all management levels report on what has actually happened and the result of these sessions, what action has been taken, and what are the results? Management Challenges from the 21st Century, Peter F. Drucker. Questions. Does my organization abandon things that no longer contribute? Action. Take the steps necessarily to institute or recommend a formal process of abandonment for your organization. Concentrate on few tasks. Is this still worth doing? The executive who wants to be effective and who wants to organize or the organization to be effective, policies, all programs, all activities, all tasks. He or she always asks, is this still worth doing? If it isn't, the executive gets rid of it, and so to be able to concentrate on few tasks that, if done with excellence, will really make a difference with the results of his or her own job or in the performance of his organization. Questions. Where is the real value added in my organization? Am I focused on tasks that is done well? Will add value to, con to contribute to my results and to... And the back room is somebody else's front room. Your back room is somebody else's front room. Peter Drucker gets credit for this one. We practiced it. Don't run a print shop. Let's let a printing company do that. It's understandable where the real value is at in putting your best people and resources behind that. Back rooms, by definition, will never be able to attract your best. We took Peter Drucker's advice. We moved to the GE's back rooms in the United States to the front room in India. Actions. 
Slow off an old activity before you start off on a new one. Stimulate creativity by abandoning the old to create room for the new. Priorities and posteriorities. There are always a more there are always more productive tasks for tomorrow than there is time to do them, and more opportunities than there are capable people to take care of them. Questions. Do I succumb to the tyranny of the urgent? Do I pay more attention to the flow of events which clamor my attention and in this process sacrifice the truly important tasks? Check your performance. Effective leaders check their performance. They write down what I do and hope to achieve to take this assignment. They put away their goals for six months and come back and check their performance against those goals and the way they find out what they'll do well when they do it poorly and if they do it poorly or well. They also find out whether or not they pick the truly important things to do. I've seen a great many people who have exceedingly good who are exceedingly good at execution but exceedingly poor at picking up the important things. And they are magnificent in getting the unimportant things done. They have an impressive record of achieving on trivial matters. Prison, prisoner of your own organization. When you are the chief executive, you're the prisoner of your organization. The moment you're in the office, everybody comes to you and wants something done and useless is to lock the door. They'll break in, so you have to get outside the office, but still it isn't, it isn't traveling. It's being at home or having a secret elsewhere. When you're alone, you're in a secret office that takes question. What needs to be done? Develop your priorities and have more, don't have more than two. I don't know about anybody who can do three things at the same time and do them well. Do one task at a time or, or two tasks at a time. That's it. Okay, two workers better for most. Most people need to change the pace, but when you are out there finishing two jobs, reach the point where there is futile, where you make a list again. Don't go back to priority three. At that point, it's obsolete. Action. Decide which task to give priority and which task to postpone. Postponing the work to top management. Pressure always favor what goes on inside. Another predictable result of leaving control of priorities is to pressures, that is to work for top management, does not get it all done. There's always postponed work, postponed in work, for it does not try to solve yesterday's crises, but to make different tomorrows. Pressures always favor for the ones that goes on inside. This always a favor for happening over to, as against the future. The crises over the opportunity, the immediate and visible over the real, and the urgent over the relevant. Questions. Does the pressure of my organization always favor yesterday? Does top management pay attention to the outside of the organization, or is it consumed by events on the inside? Actions. Balance the concerns to... Balance the concerns of the present with the opportunities of the future. Balance your concerns of the present with the opportunities of the future and keep focused on the issues that are relevant to your job you are supposed to be doing. Deciding on posterior, posteriorities. Posteriorities. The reason why so many executives concentrate on the difficulty of setting posteriorities is that deciding what tasks not to tackle at the sticking of the decision and of sticking to that decision of which tasks not to tackle. Most executives have learned that what are the postpones one actually abandons? A good many of them suspect that nothing less desirable to take up later project that one has postponed when it first came up. Questions. Do I often abandon the tasks I postpone? Do I try to keep all tasks going? Doing a little of each yet not finishing any one of them? Do I find it difficult to set priorities? Mission driven. Leaders communicate in a sense that people around them know what they are trying to do. They are purpose-driven, yes, mission-driven. They know to establish a mission and the other thing they know how to say no. The pressure of leaders of 984 different things is unbearable. So the effective ones learn how to say no and stick with it. They don't suffocate themselves as a result. Too many leaders do this with a little bit of 25 things and get, and get nothing done. They are very popular because they always say yes, but then they get nothing done. Interview by Rich Colgard, Peter Drucker on leadership. Actions. Avoid the tendency of trying to do just a little bit of all your tasks. Focus on getting your highest priority tasks done. Rules of priority setting. Aim high. Aim for something that will make a difference. Courage rather than analysis dictates the truly important rules for identifying priorities. Pick your future as against the past. Focus on opportunities rather than on problems. Choose your own direction rather than climb on bandwagons and aim high. Aim for something that will make a difference rather than something that is safe and easy to do. Questions. In identifying priorities, do I focus on opportunities or problems? Do I aim high or play it safe? Focus on opportunities. Good executives focus on opportunities rather than problems. Problem solving, however, necessarily does not produce results. It prevents damage. Exploiting opportunities produces results. Actions. Pursue opportunities, revise your priorities and, pros and posteriorities in the light of realities. And aim high. Chapter 6. Effective Decisions. Decision making is the specific activity of the executive. Effective decisions... Effective decision-making involves a disciplined process of effective decisions and have specific characteristics. The first step in the decision-making process is to determine if all the decisions is necessary. 
determine if a decision is necessary. And once it's determined that a decision is necessary, the first step is to classify the decision as either a generic decision or which as a generic solution should be sought or a unique decision to which a unique solution should be found. Many problems have been solved before by an organization and the solution should be sought and put into effect. It is very important to fully understand a problem to make sure your definition of a problem explains all symptoms that are being observed. Next, you must define the sub specifications for a solution to the problem. This leads naturally to an answer to the question. What would be the correct solution to a problem? A solution that meets all boundary conditions. If if a compromise is necessary, you should make sure that it goes some way towards solving the problem, that it is towards the characteristic of a good compromise. Then you must convert the decision to an action and decide to decide who is to take the action and who is to be accountable for the results of the decision. Finally, you must follow up on determining who, if the decision has produced the desired results. The right decision requires the courage as much as an analysis. You should start by soliciting opinions from those knowledgeable about the problem. Test these opinions by asking those who offer their opinions to gather the facts that are necessary to justify their opinion. To make effective decisions, you should develop organized disagreement among those who have different options. In this way, you will come to better understand the various dimensions of the decision. And once you choose the course of any action by evaluating gains versus risks of each alternative, you will know who is most likely to implement the decision properly. Decision Making to make the decisions is the specific executive task. Good decision makers know that the decision making has its own process and its own clearly defined elements and steps. Every decision is risky. It is a commitment of present resources to the uncertain and unknown future. Ignore a single element in the process and the decision will tumble down like a badly built wall in an earthquake. But if the process is faithfully observed and the necessary steps are taken, the risk will minimize and decisions will all have a good chance of turning out and being successful. Decision making is only one of the tasks of an executive. It usually takes but a small fraction of his or her time, but it makes decisions in a specific executive task. Do I follow a systematic process for following executive decisions, or do I simply trust my instincts? Action. Follow the six elements of an effective decision-making spelled out in this chapter. Follow the six elements of effective decision-making spelled out in this chapter. Is a decision really necessary? Every decision is like surgery. It is an intervention into a system and therefore carries with it the risk of a shock. One does not make unnecessary decisions many more than a good surgeon does unnecessarily surgeries. Individual decision makers, like individual surgeons, differ in them styles. Some are more radical, some are more conservative than others. But at the large, they agree on the rules, and it has to make a decision when a condition is likely to de degenerate if nothing is done. This also applies with respect to opportunity. The opportunity is important and is likely to vanish unless one acts with dispatch, one acts, and the one makes a radical change. Questions. Do I act quickly when a situation I'm facing deteriorating is deteriorating rapidly or when an important opportunity is likely to vanish suddenly? Actions. Do I make unnecessary decisions but act courageously when a situation is deteriorating rapidly and when a significant opportunity is likely to pass you by if you delay? Elements of effective decision making. Executives minimize risk and decision making by following six elements of effective decision making, which are number one, classify the problem, number two, defining the problem, three, specifications of a decision, number four, deciding on what is right, number five, building actions into the decisions, and six, testing the decisions against actual results. Classify the problem, define the problem, specifications of the decision, deciding on what is right, building actions into the decision, and testing the decision against actual results. Actions. Memorize the six steps and apply them to every complex decision you face. Classifying the problem. It is the generic situation or an exception. The first question of effective decision makers ask, is this a generic situation or an exception? Is that something that underlies a great many occurrences or the occurrences of a unique event that needs to be to deal with is with as such. The generic always has answered though as a rule, a principle. The exceptional can always be handled as such as it comes. All events, but the truly unique require a generic solution. They require a rule, a policy, a principle. Questions. Is the current decision situation I'm facing generic either to my organization or to the industry? Is it unique event or early manifestation of a new class of problems? Why am I classifying this decision as either generic or unique? Actions. Take a reoccurring crisis of your organization is facing right now. Figure out the cause of an established and generic rule that will resolve all future occurrences of the current crises. Defining the problem. 
The next key element is defining the problems. In this, the most important element is making an effective decision is defining the problem. What effective decision makers have learned to start out with is assumptions that the, the way they look at problems in all likelihood is not what it really is, but they work until they understand the right problem. Effective decision makers ask, what is all this about? What is this all about? What is, the pertinent, what is pertinent here? What is key to this situation? Questions. Is there a past? In the past, have I picked the wrong answer to the right problem or the right answer to the wrong problem? Which of these was easier for me to diagnose and repair? Actions. Pick a problem you are now facing. Make sure your definition of the problem explains and encompasses all the observable facts of symptoms. Remember, until the definition explains the observable facts, it is either still incomplete and a wrong definition of the problem. The wrong answer is to the right problem with almost the way of being easier to diagnose the repair than the right answer to the wrong problem. Specifications of a decision. The affected person knows that a decision that does not satisfy the boundary conditions is ineffectual and inappropriate. The third major element in the decision process is clear specifications as what is the decision has to accomplish. What are the minimal goals has to attain? What are the minimal goals it has to attain? What is the minimal needed to resolve the problem? The effective executive knows that the decision that does not satisfy the boundary conditions is ineffectual and inappropriate. Questions. Have I made an incorrect decision recently? What were the boundary conditions, the decision that should be satisfied? Should I have known the advance that the decisions would have not achieved its intended purpose? Actions. Consider a decision you are facing right now. Which conditions should you decision satisfy? Articulate these boundary conditions for your decision. Actions. Consider a decision you are facing right now. Which conditions should you decision... Which conditions should the decision satisfy? Articulate these boundary conditions for the decision. Deciding on what is right. One has to start on with what is right rather than what is acceptable, let alone who is right, precisely because of always has to be compromised in the end. But if one does not know what right is to satisfy the specifications of a boundary conditions, one cannot, one cannot distinguish between the right compromise and the wrong compromise, and will end up by making the wrong compromise. Question. What is right for a decision? I am now considering... Asking what is right for the enterprise does not guarantee that the right decision will be made, even the most brilliant executive human and prone to mistakes and prejudices. But failure to ask the questions virtually guarantees the wrong decision. Executives know also that the decision that isn't right for the enterprise will ultimately not be right for any of the skate holders. This practice is especially important for executives and family-run businesses. The majority of businesses in every country, particularly when we're making decisions about people and the successful family companies, relative promoted, promoted only and that he or she is measurably superior to all non-relatives on the same level. What makes an effective executive? Action. In a situation you are currently facing, start with the steps to achieve the right outcomes to the decision that you have been considering. The right compromise. Half a loaf is better than no bread. There are two different kinds of compromise. One kind of expressed in the old proverb, half a loaf is better than no bread, or the other kind expressed the story of the judgment of Solomon, which was clearly based on the realization that half a baby is worse than no baby at all. If the first instance of a boundary conditions are still being satisfied, the purpose of bread is to provide food. The half a loaf is still food. Half a baby, however, is not satisfied the boundary conditions, for half a baby is not half of a living or growing child. It's a corpse in two pieces. Question. What compromises are acceptable for the decision I am facing right now? Action. If you must compromise, make the right one, one that has least partially satisfies the boundaries and conditions, building action into decisions. Unless the decision has degenerated into work, it is not a decision. It is at best a good intention. It has to be degenerated into work. Converting the decision into an action is the fifth major element of decision processes. Which thinking through the boundaries conditions is which miss di most difficult steps in decision making. Converting decision into an effective action is usually the most time consuming one. Yet, a decision will not most become an effective unless the action commits have been built into the decision from the start. In fact, no decision has been made unless carrying out its own specific steps that has become someone else's work assignment and responsibility. Until then, there are only good intentions. Questions. Here I recently experienced a failure because I didn't convert a right decision into an effective action. What steps did I admit? Actions. Convert a decision you have just made or are about to make into an action. Specifically answer these four questions. Number one. Who has to know of the decision? Number two. What action has to be taken? Number three. Who is to take it? Number four. What does the action have to be so that the other people will have to do it and they can... And what does the action have to be so that people who have to do it can take it? Testing the decision against actual results. 
Finally, a feedback has to be built into the decision providing continuing testing against actual events. And the expectations that underlie the decision, even if the best decisions have high probability of being wrong, even the most effective and eventuals become obsolete. One needs organized information for the feedback. One needs reports and figures unless one builds one's feedback around direct exposure reality unless the disciplines of oneself go into the look. One condemns oneself to a sterile dogmatis dogmatism and with its ineffectiveness. Questions. Do I really... Do I rely exclusively on formal reports on the effects of decisions, or do I go out and obtain first-hand knowledge of results of the decisions on a regular basis? Take responsibility for decisions. A decision has not been made until people know the name of the person responsible for carrying it out, the deadline, the names of the people who will be affected by the decision and therefore have to know about, understand, and approve it, or at least not strongly opposed to it, and the names of people who have to be informed of the decision, even if they're not directly affected by it. An extraordinary number of organizational decisions run into trouble because these bases are not covered. It's just important to review decisions periodically, and it's to make them careful carefully in the first place. That way, a poor decision can be corrected before it really does damage. These reviews can overcome anything from the result of assumptions underlying the decision. Confront the brutal facts. Conduct autopsies without blame. Good to great. Why some companies make it, make the leap, and others don't. Actions. Do not divorce yourself from reality and thereby fall victim to persistence in a course of action longer than it has ceased to be appropriate or even rational. Build continuous learning into the work of obtaining feedback from results and decisions. Compare this feedback to an expectation you had when the decision was made. The effective decision. A decision is a judgment. It is a choice between alternatives. It's rarely a choice between right and wrong. It's the best choice between almost right and probably wrong. But... Much is often a choice between two courses of action, neither is which is pro provably or nearly right than the other. But executives who have to make an effective decision know that it does not start with facts. One starts with opinions. These are, of course, nothing but untested hypotheses and, as such, worthless unless tested against reality. The understanding that underlies the right decision grows out of the clash of conflict and diverting opinions and out of the serious consideration of competing alternatives. To get the facts first is impossible. To get the facts first is impossible. There are no facts unless the one has a criterion of, rel rel of relevance. Events by themselves are not facts. Questions. Do I start my decision-making process by searching for facts, or do I start with my opinions? Actions. Recognize that decision is a judgment, and that there are no facts unless the criterion of the relevance that is clearly defined a problem. Defined problem. Start with the untested hypotheses. The one rigorous method that enables you to test an opinion against the base of the clear recognizing the opinions comes first. No one can fail to see whether to start out the untested hypotheses in a decision making as in science of only starting points. From we know with this an hypothesis, one does argue them, one tests them, one finds which hypotheses are to enable and therefore are worthy of serious consideration and which are eliminated by the first test against observable experience. The effective executive encourages opinions, but he insists that people who voice them also think that what is that is the tested of the opinion against reality would have to show. Questions. Do I treat decision making as a process of hypothesis testing as in science, or do I treat decision making as a search from facts and various alternatives? Action. Treat the decision-making process as a process of hypothesis testing requiring a criterion of relevance and opinions that must be tested against the observable facts. Opinions rather than facts. The effective executive asks, what do we have to know to test the validity of this hypothesis? What would the facts have to, be, to make this opinion tenable? And to make it a habit in himself and the people to whom it works, and to think through to spell out what needs to be looked at, studied, and tested. He insisted the people who voice an opinion also take responsibility for defining what factual findings can be expected and how it should be looked for, and what and how it should be looked for. Questions. What opinions with which I've started current decision processes have to be tested against facts in order for these opinions to form a tenable hypothesis? Actions. Think about the decisions from which you are facing. Seek opinions about the decisions from people knowledgeable in your areas and decision. What facts are necessary to support the opinions offered? Ask those who support these opinions and test them against the facts or test them against, uh, test your, test them against yourself and against the facts. Develop disagreement. Decisions of the kind of executives has to make Decisions of the kind the executives have to make are not made well by acclamation. They're not made well by acclamation. Unless one has considered alternatives, one has, closed, has a closed mind. This above all explains why effective decision makers deliberately create dissension and disagreement rather than consensus. Decisions of the kind of executive has to make are not made well by acclamation. They are made well only by based off of a clash of conflicting views, the dialogue between different points of view and the choices between different judgments. The first rule of decision making is that one does not make a decision unless there is a disagreement. 
Questions. How do I develop alternatives for decisions that must be made? Do I suffer from undue influences from those in my organization who stand in the gain and lose from my decisions? Do I stimulate the imagination of parties to a decision? First who, then what? Good to great management teams consist of people who debate vigorously and search for the best answers, yet who unify behind decisions regardless of parachoil parachoil interests actions develop a process for listening for soliciting organized disagreement among the associates over decision alternatives make sure that by encouraging disagreement that it's not to lost in the fog for some of your decisions to prove deficient or wrong the decision the effective decision maker compares effort and risk from the actions to take of inaction there's no formula for the right decision here but the guideline is so clear that decision is the concrete case to rarely difficult they are to act if a balance of benefits greatly outweigh the cost of the risk act or not to act but to do not hedge or compromise question do i tend to hedge your decision if i know the decision is not going to be popular actions do I not rush into a decision unless you are do not rush into a decision unless you are sure to understand what the decision is all about. But when the process has been followed and the decision is ready to be made, act and don't act, but do not hedge by, for example, asking for another study. Act. In a conclusion, effectiveness must be learned. Best hope to make society productive, effectiveness must be learned. Effectiveness reveals itself in a crucial to one's personal self-development, the organizational development, the fulfillment of viable and modern society. Self-development is the knowledge worker and the central development is the organization, whether it's to be business, government, research, laboratorial, hospital, or military service. It is the way towards performance of the organization. As executives work towards becoming an effective and effective, they raise the performance level of a whole organization. They raise the sights of people, their own well as others. Executive effectiveness is our best hope for modern society, productive, economical, and valuable socially. And viable socially. Questions. Am I more effective now than when I started this book? Which practices should I go back and practice some more? One bonus practice of the effective executive is the one that's so important in which I elevate to the rule. Listen. First. Speak. Last. Effective executives differ widely in their personality, strength, and weaknesses, values, and beliefs. All they have in common is that they get the right things done. Some are born effective. Others demand too great for the satisfaction of extraordinary talent. Effectiveness is a discipline. It's like a discipline of effectiveness that can be learned and must be learned. Where do I belong? Successful careers are not planned. They are developed by people who are prepared for opportunities because they know their strengths, their methods of work, and their values. Knowing where... One belongs can transform an ordinary person, hardworking, to a competent but otherwise mediocre, into an outstanding performer. Level 5 Leadership Level 5 Leadership displays a workmanlike diligence, more, more, plow, more plow horse than show horse. Actions You can learn to be an effective person, and effective must be learned, and effectiveness must be learned. Train yourself in effectiveness. Assess your development in effectiveness periodically. The Effective Executive in Action Peter F. Drucker and Joseph A. Marciariello.